All right, let's have a look at uh, ECG case number 17. For this case, we give you a 45-year-old male. He's in the gym. Uh, he's complaining of crushing chest pain, and he tells you that he became very short of breath and started having pain when he was uh, working out. He is very pale and diaphoretic, and when you ask him about medical history, he tells you that he hasn't been to the doctor in years. So from this presentation, obviously you're going to want to get a 12 EDKG. You got to think cardiac until proven otherwise. He's pale. He's diaphoretic. Um, those are both signs of shock. He also has crushing chest pain with dyspnea. So I mean, everything kind of leans towards a possible MI here. So we definitely want to uh, keep that in our differential and do a 12 lead EKG. Here's the uh, 12 lead that you obtain from this patient. Right off the bat, you can see that it is not normal. There are some things that vary. So let's start with the rhythm. Uh, it looks to be a sinus rhythm. You have a P wave for every QRS complex. Uh, it's within a normal rate. You have upright P waves where you should have them in the limb leads and the negative P waves in AVR. Uh, so it looks to be sinus. Uh, looking at the axis, if you were to do the quick quadrant method for the frontal plane axis, you'd see lead one is positive and AVF is positive. So your QRS axis is normal in the frontal plane. And then looking over here at the precordial axis, while uh, it is normal, it does go from a mostly negative QRS complex in V1 to a mostly positive QRS complex in v V6, it is not normal to see these very prominent R waves in V2. Okay, this is sort of an early R wave progression. You can't really say it's early because it does transition between V3 and V4, or between V2 and V4, really. So we don't want to say it's early R-wave progression, but we want to pay attention to these, these uh, R-waves in V2. They could mean something. So looking further now, looking at ST and T-wave changes, it is difficult in uh, the inferior leads here to identify if there's any ST elevation, okay, because we have a wavy baseline. It kind of wanders a little bit, right? Although I have said before that this morphology in AVL, if you see this T-wave inversion and ST depression like you do in AVL, the first thing you got to think is an early inferior wall MI, okay? This in AVL usually means early inferior wall MI. There's not much of anything else that will cause that morphology. And obviously you can see the ST and T wave changes in these right precordial leads. These are the right precordial leads. Right precordial leads. Uh, you see ST depression, T wave inversion, okay? So what is that? This is the most prominent thing we can see. We really can't tell much in the inferior leads, so let's just kind of cancel them out. We are considering an early inferior wall MI, but again, we can't confirm it because of the wavy baseline in the inferior leads. And we see all of this in the, uh, I'm sorry, the right precordial leads in V1, V2, and V3. We see some ST depression, T wave inversion, and I did say that there was a little bit of a tall R wave, more than normal in V2. They say that if the RS ratio in V1 or V2 is greater than one. So if you have a R wave that's taller than its S wave in V1 or V2, that's very prominent. But it's not really that big in V2. It's just something to note. So what is that? Well, if you were to take the right precordial leads and flip them upside down and look at them backwards, so I've done that for you here. These are what they normally look like. And we flip them over here, okay? And you can see that posteriorly, what's happening is ST elevation. So the, the, that R wave that we saw in V2, this is V2 right here, V3 is over here, V1 is now on the bottom. That R wave we saw in V2 is now a Q wave. That ST depression is now ST elevation, and those inverted T waves are upright. Okay, so this is indicative of a posterior wall MI. So when you see this over here, when you see what you see here in V1, V2, and V3, the ST depression, T wave inversion, especially when you start to see an R wave develop, it's indicative of a posterior wall MI, which usually accompanies an inferior wall MI. Because, well, there's a couple reasons. The posterior wall is either fed by the left circumflex, which is about 15% of people, by the right coronary artery, which is about 85% of people, and some people even have an anastomosis in the back where both coronary arteries kind of come together. Um, 
And when you have an inferior wall MI, you either have a left circumflex uh, in infarction or a left circumflex occlusion or a right coronary artery occlusion, which is much more uh, common, where you have an inferior wall MI and a posterior wall MI. And the posterior wall is the last, it's the end of the coronary artery, so it's the last place to get blood flow. So it would be the first place to show signs of infarction. And it often is with an inferior wall MI. People usually just chalk this up as reciprocal changes. It's reciprocal, but it's reciprocal to the posterior wall, not the inferior wall. So if this was all you saw, and you, if you did a posterior 12 lead, which I've talked about in previous ECG cases, doing a posterior 12 lead by, by taking basically what you would do. Let me see if I can draw it for you. If this is the person's back, and this is the scapula here, draw the back here. So this is your scapula, I'm kind of drawing it prominent. Uh, you would take V4, V5, and V6, and you continue those around the back. And you put V4 there, V5 there, and V6 right about there, and you end up with V7, V8, and V9. Okay? And you would want to make sure to change that on your 12 lead. All right? And if you did a posterior 12 lead, if you didn't see the ST elevation in the inferior leads, but you saw this, all right, and did a posterior 12 lead, now you have enough to call STEMI. You would have ST elevation in two or more greater leads. So looking back at the 12 lead, I'm saying this is an inferior wall MI with a posterior wall MI. All right, and you're even having uh, some of these low lateral changes over here. If you look at B6, it does look to be a little bit elevated, not much, all right? Again, like I said, this is a wavy baseline in the inferior leads, so I wouldn't put too much uh, invested into that. I would definitely pay attention to this and this, and you know maybe do a posterior 12 lead if I wanted to make sure and uh, call STEMI from there. So that's the case. It was a pretty easy one. I think uh, most of you guys got it out there. If you want to see anything else, uh, all the other ECG cases, if, send me an email also. If you, if you have any questions, you could send me any 12 leads. But subscribe. Click the subscribe. Uh, I'm going to put a link there so you can click it right now. Um, or you can watch these other videos. Uh, I do an ECG access tutorial and a funnel branch block tutorial. And they're pretty good. I mean, I, I think I explained uh, both of those things pretty well. And give me a thumbs up and like the video if you learned anything. Or if you learn anything from any of my videos, just uh, like them. I'll see you next time. Have a good day and uh, keep on interpreting EKGs. Have fun.